I'm Judith Bunnell. I'm a HKS MPP 1984. I'm on the alumni board. And I had the pleasure when I was at the Kennedy School, Judy Krugel was head of career services um, and was very, I was just telling her, she was instrumental in my husband, who is also a classmate, and me getting our first jobs out of the Kennedy School. And she was a good friend and someone who uh, really boosted me up as I was going through my last year of the Kennedy School. So thank you, Judy. Oh, thank you. And for those of you who... Um, no, Judy. She she was at the Kennedy School for over 30 years. I think it was 33 years. Is 33. that right? 33 years. She had a variety of positions. She can talk a little bit more about them herself, but um, she came to the Kennedy School as head of the Office of Career Services. I think it's called Career Advancement now. She was the registrar after we all left or after I left, and she was also the Associate Dean of Students at the Kennedy School and for many years um, served on the admissions committee. So it, we're gonna talk about retiring, we're gonna talk about how to age gracefully, but just know she's got a background in a lot of different things at the Kennedy School and has, and I'll just give you a little tip. She lives a couple of blocks from the Kennedy School. So if you are visiting in Cambridge, um, reach out to Karen or to Kristen, and I'm sure she can get you in touch with Judy. They can get you in touch with Judy, and you could go have a cup of coffee or a cocktail, as Joseph and I did fairly recently. <laughs> so, so welcome, Judy, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. Um, Judy has been blogging about aging, um, besides her position at the Kennedy School, I think one of your unofficial passions has been about how to age gracefully and how to think about aging. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I don't know all, um, let me actually start. Let's do a little fun poll. Um, Kristen, um, if you could put in the chat, there it is, I see untitled poll. If folks could go to the chat and put what decade you were at the Kennedy School. So I'm putting in 1980 for me, cause I was in there at 1984, submit. And Kristen, when you get um, some results, if you could post those and also just jump in and tell us, but we wanna see who's here. Um, um, hi, Corinna. Um, we wanna see who, who's on the call, but I think most of us are in our 50s, 60s and 70s. Maybe there's a few people younger and older. Um, there we go. Oh, here we go. Can people see, if you go to the untitled poll, you'll see that we don't have anyone from the 60s. 6% 6 of us are in the graduated in the 70s. 35% of us, so the largest group graduated in the 80s. 32% graduated in the 90s. The 2000s, 21%, 2010, 6%. And um, there we go. So can everyone see that? Give me a little nod if you can see that. Okay, so we have a nice range of people. So let me just start by asking Judy about her own retirement from the Kennedy School. You heard me say she was there for 33 years. Judy, how did you start thinking about retiring from the Kennedy School? What came up? Well, let me start by saying I'm so thrilled to see all of you and to keep my connections with the Kennedy School. And um, this year in January, I actually audited a January module taught by um, uh, the in one on Indian nations. And I mean, I still feel like I'm part of the school, even though I've been gone for 10 years. So um, retiring for me, I mean, this is all about planning your life and planning what's good for you. But retirement for me is now 10 years ago. And I will say that it's been an interesting journey. And I'd love to share it with some of you because it isn't all that easy, but it can be very, very satisfying. So how did you start, when did you know it was time to retire from the Kennedy School? And how did you start planning for it? Or did you plan for it? Well, I'm, I might have waited too long. I mean, it was, I was, um, I just had my 85th birthday. And so I was, uh, and I retired 10 years ago, which is, um, I mean, I didn't feel like it, that I wasn't, you know, being productive, but it was kind of time to move on and to see what else I wanted to do, you know, in the years that I remained healthy. and. Fortunately, knock on wood, I have been healthy. And um, the retirement is 
really, really, really hard. You, you lose your community, you lose your, um, your daily schedule. You don't, you have to, you don't actually have to set an alarm every morning for the first time in all the years that I had worked, but it's definitely an adjustment. And I'm happy to share part of that journey um, with you guys. And if it can help at all, perfect. And if not, it's great to see you anyway. Um, did you retire cold turkey, Judy, or did you kind of keep consulting work or how did, how did you make the transition? Well, I, my, my, the dean of the Kennedy School then was David Elwood, and he offered me the opportunity to work half time if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I just decided that either I was going to be, this is my own words, a force at the Kennedy School or I wasn't going to be at the Kennedy School. And I decided that it was a good time to move on. And my husband had is older than I, and he had retired a bit from his teaching job at Boston College. And so I thought we could do, you know, we maybe could do some interesting things. And believe me, that journey has been interesting. No doubt about it. I'm fortunate enough. And, and, and let me just say this about that. I think one of the most important things about being retired is taking care of yourself, eating well, sleeping well, having the networks. I mean, you, you don't realize when you're working how much you depend on your work community as your, as your, your people, you know? And so you sort of have to be ready to spread yourself a little wider in terms of your relationships with people. And um, I would say that it's a really good idea to know some younger people like I do, <laughs> because I can keep in touch with them and they're my friends, you know, as I begin to see my friends be ill or be older or whatever. How, so, so speaking of community, how did you make, how did you make new friends after you left the Kennedy School? Because I presume you kind of, you drifted away from some of your Kennedy School friends. So how did you fill that void? Well, I started to get, mm -hmm. what started, activities did you do? Well, what, I, you know? I had a kind of a rough transition because I really it wasn't easy for me to find out the things that would be satisfying to me I've always been a writer I had a lot of uh, articles in the newspaper earlier in my career and uh, so I knew I wanted to go back to writing I had started my blog I, I've been writing a blog on life I guess <laughs> since uh, since I turned 70 because I was uh, I've, I've always been a journalist I mean um, I've always kept a journal and um, my son Seth MPP um, 97 uh, is, a, is a journalist. And he said to me, why don't you get with it mother and um, do your journal online and call it a blog. So I have been blogging. I was started blogging when I was still at the Kennedy School. So I forget what question I'm asking, but anyway. Uh, so how did I get younger friends? So I have a big um, group of people who have been with me reading my blog for years and years. Some of them I've met. They, I feel like they're all my friends. But my transition to doing volunteer work was not easy. I, I, I will say that. That was difficult because I wasn't, you know, I, I'd been supporting some nonprofit groups and I, I tried to get to work with them. I had a very bad experience trying to um, volunteer for Planned Parenthood. They weren't calling me back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I ended up um, volunteering for a charter school in the inner city um, where I was helping their kids figure out their lives, sort of going back to my career roots. And I thought that was extremely gratifying. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but it took a while for me to get into what was really going to be my life as a retired person. And now it's so busy, it's beyond belief. Um, it's just so gratifying to find other ways to give, to give back um, than in your paid jobs. So when you look at a potential nonprofit to volunteer with Judy, what, are you, what do you think someone should look for? I mean, how do, how do you know it's a good fit or when do you know it's a bad fit? Well, the, the, um, the thing is that if you can't use your strengths, then it's a bad fit. And if you don't have, if you don't feel satisfied by what you've done, um, then it's a bad fit. And one of the things that I did was I joined an organization called the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement because I've always been a studier and a, a learner. At the moment, I'm trying to learn Portuguese, which is 
not that easy if anybody knows how to speak Portuguese. Um, and I've also audited classes, et cetera. So you just have to find a nice balance between what you can give and what you could take. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, it does. I mean, are you looking, so you're looking for a place that uh, honors your talents, it sounds like, that that will take advantage of your talents. Are you also looking for the right mix of people? Do you kind of, is that a place you can find community if you're volunteering in a nonprofit? You can, um, but that's, those aren't the people that have really become my friends. I think you just reach out to your friends that you've had forever and also through I don't know, various activities. I have managed to get some younger friends. I can't, I can't uh, think about exactly what I've done uh, to do that. But, uh, you know, my Kennedy School uh, alums are my friends. Um, I'm in close touch with many of them from different years and I'm definitely in close touch. I don't know if any of you were there during the um, Joe McCarthy era, um, who was a associate dean, who was a I don't know. Um, he was my boss for a long time and he and I are still in touch and he's still talking to a bunch of Kenny school alums and advising them, even though he's been gone for longer than I have. So mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, you have to do what works for you. And the thing that I really think is important is to think about it in advance. I mean, it cold Turkey is hard. So you have to, your plan may not work. My plan was that I was going to, um, just volunteer and study and the first couple places that I tried at least with the volunteering didn't work so much but fortunately I always had my writing I always had a good group of friends and so I mean I couldn't I there's a there's this um U curve that is supposed to be that you're happy as here you get a little less happy in, in the middle of your life and then toward the end of your life all of a sudden you're happier again and uh, it's been proven by people who know more than I do that that happens and I'm fine it's happening to me. I feel like I am, um, I just am very blessed with good friends and with having my, as far as I know, <laughs> I haven't lost my uh, ability to think and do. And uh, it's just a, a very happy time, but it's a bit of a transition to get here because you're coming from, a very, a very, um, a life where you have, it's very structured into a life where, I mean, I don't set an alarm clock that much. So that's amazing. That help? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. No, thank you. Um, so you talked about being, about planning for retirement. What when can now maybe you need to think back a little bit, but what do you do to plan? Um, how do you plan for retirement? What do you do? You make sure you yeah, do you check on your friend network? Do you you know make sure you do all your doctor's appointments? How do you plan for retirement and a healthy aging process? I mean, what do you do? What do you do while you've got a job? I guess to get ready for retirement. Well, mostly if you have a job as wonderful as job as I did, you don't really have a lot of time to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, I had two things in my life, my work and my family, and that's basically all I did. I, uh, so I didn't have a lot of time. I, I will say in all honesty that I was feeling a bit lost when I stopped working. And I thought I don't have to get up in the morning, get on my bike and ride to HKS. And um, what does that mean for me? And because I had a little trouble finding out what it meant to me, there was a period of time when I felt, I mean, I don't want to say, let me just say down. I wasn't, uh, you know, depressed. Uh, what's the word I want when, you know, when you need to do something about it, but I did feel down. And um, my husband, who is also retired, was already teaching in this, uh, in the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement, because that's what he does. And that's what he loves. So he had that and um, I didn't, so it took me a while. And if I had it to do over again, I would have thought about it more before it happened. But you have to, you guys have to remember that I'm old enough to have been in the silent generation. And um, mm -hmm. when I had young children and I was working at the Kennedy School, um, I and one other woman on my own, on my block were the only women who were working, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so you don't, 
you know, it, it's much different now. And a lot of people never don't work, but you, um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that things are, ch are changed now. There are many more opportunities for women. Um, you know, when I graduated from college, um, <laughs> I failed. Uh, I did get my BA, but I didn't get my MRS. And in my generation, that was not so good. <laughs> uh, in the end, it worked out just fine for me because I had a beautiful marriage of 50 some years. Uh, but it, it's a different, it's a different thing now. So I can't really, I, I didn't ever think that I would be working for, for 33 years at the same organization. I didn't, I didn't have a plan. It just was, I was so lucky. I really think that's what it is. I was, there's a lot of luck involved, but you guys know now that you have to think about that. And so take advantage of my, you know, failing at doing the planning that I thought was uh, necessary and do it, do it now. Uh, you will know when it's time to retire. You will know when, for me, it was new people were coming on board. And um, I just felt like you have to give the next generation a chance. And I had already overstayed my age, you know, uh, 75 when I retired. So it's, it's a very personal thing. Um, for me, it worked out. Um, I still feel like I'm part of the Kennedy School. And in many ways, I go to many events there. As I said, I, I um, uh, audited a class in January. So, I mean, I'm lucky enough to live down the street. Uh, not all of you are, but I, I second Judy's comment. If you do come to town, <laughs> please call me for coffee. What, so, so when people, um, so here, here's a question. You, you've mentioned kind of aging um, gracefully too, Judy. What do you do to take care of your health? What should, what should people maybe 10 years younger than you are, 20 years younger than you are be doing now to prepare for um, having a healthy retirement? What are the health tricks you wanna pass on? I can't tell you how important it is to me. And I think it's one of the reasons why I'm still functioning as well as I am, because I have been, I used to run. And when I stopped running, I, um, I started a program very young of weightlifting, um, stretching. I walk every, I walk at least an average of two miles a day, sometimes longer. Um, I eat blueberries. This is important. I eat blueberries every morning <laughs> and um, I, I, I very, I try to be really careful about, uh, I eat much more carefully than I used to, you know, and I, I see my grandchildren eating all these salty snacks, which I used to love and I, but they too will come to a stage when they have to stop doing that. But I really think taking care of your, I think exercise is so crucial. I couldn't, I can't emphasize enough how much uh, it, I mean, I'm strong and I can lift things that nobody can lift. And I live in a place now where there's a lot of older people, although it's not an official retirement place. And they come, the, the people come to the, the people who are like, like the concierge people, they come and say, well, don't you want some help with your groceries? And here I am, you know, lugging my groceries in from the car. And I think it's all because I take care of myself. And is that the answer you want? Yeah, know. no, no. Um, so we've had a couple of questions and I'm just, and I'll just remind folks as we go along, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them as we go along. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions, hopefully directly to Judy. We've had a couple of questions, Judy, that I'm tracking in the chat. One is housing options. Did you have to change your housing situation as you age? Did you move from a single family house to a congress? I mean, talk about how you've changed your housing options or if you have, and how have your friends changed their housing options as they've aged? This is a really, really difficult issue. Um, for me, my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when we were still living in a home and it had four floors. So I thought that the steps might be bad. And so um, we made a decision. Our kids, this is very personal, but I'll share it with you guys anyway, because you're my friends. Um, we made a decision to uh, our children um, who live in Maryland. Uh, I have a son and his family who live in Maryland, and they wanted to know if we would be willing to 
come and live near them because they thought it might be easier as we age, et cetera, et cetera. So we did do that after years and years and years of living in um, Cambridge and Boston and Newton. Uh, we moved to DC and um, we moved to a, a continuing care organization uh, facility. Mm -hmm. And the first night that I walked down the corridor to our apartment, I knew that I could not stay there for the rest of my life. So okay. six months later, we moved back to Boston, <laughs> to Cambridge. And uh, it was a hard decision to lift up, you know, to move twice. But my point that I wish to make is that you have to find out what works for you. For, for me, living um, in a place where you have dinner with everybody every night, it just doesn't, didn't work. So, but many, many people find that uh, useful. Now I live on my own and I come and go as I please. And I have wonderful friends here who would probably worry about me if they didn't see me in a long time, but you know, that's it just what worked for me. So that is a really important, where you live is very important. I miss my house, I but I have a beautiful view of the Charles River and I can walk to Harvard Square. And um, so I, I Luck pays a big part of it. My health has been, I mean, I've, I've had my health challenges as well. I have a couple of replaced knees and um, I had an early detected breast cancer and, you know, you age and things happen. But I would just say that if you, if you are, take care of yourself and you keep yourself active and you find your way to contribute that works for you and it's not always going to be the same for all of us, um, and, and you have a circle of friends, especially if the few of them are younger than you are, then life is really good. And that, that you that says you're happy at the end of your life, I, I think it's really true. You know, we had a question in the chat and I think it's a good one. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Judy, but you are, you're, you're I by nature on the spot today. That, oh, I mean, um, you guys, yeah. like, oh How my God, have I really said that? <laughs> How do you manage your... When you retire, how do you manage your mental health? You kind of alluded to this and said you didn't become depressed, but it was hard. What are your current tricks for keeping your mental health healthy? Um, we had someone ask about that, and I think that's so important. Well, um, I really think that um, I did try, for a while I was meditating, and particularly when things were difficult, and I think that was good. But to me, I think my mental health is, um, related to being active and to my writing. I think writing, keeping a journal, even if you aren't a show off and keep it online like I do, uh, it's very gratifying. And so that helps me process what I'm thinking. In fact, sometimes um, I, I uh, published a book about my, any, about, about this, about being in, in uh, uh, whatever. And I, and I wrote in the book that sometimes I don't really know what I think until I write it down because that's, it's really important. So keeping a journal, I think is a very healthy thing to do. I, I, like I said, I've been fortunate. My mental health, except when I moved to the wrong place has been strong, but you have to keep yourself active and contributing and do whatever works for you in terms of, you know, keeping yourself happy. It's just important. It doesn't, nobody does it for you. You have to take responsibility for yourself. So it sounds like you're a fan of meditation. If people want to join a mindfulness group, um, that's, that's, that's very a good. Helpful. Okay. Um, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Talk about um, when you retired, how did your relationship with your, with your sons change? <laughs> or not change, I guess. What happened with your son? Well, um, I have one son who is in touch with me every day and another son who calls out of obligation once a week. So it just, it just depends. I mean, they are, um, they're great. I, I, I'm so proud of them. And um, I don't know, I, I don't really know what else I can say about that. Did you find that you had more time that they, you know, that they started to worry about you, the relationship of who to worry about changed or? Um, I, you know what, they're 
always there for me. And uh, but I, I don't. They have their lives, and I and I'm proud of them. As I as and I would say this to anybody who's a parent: the key thing is to not take um, credit and not take blame. So mm -hmm. that's the best way to do. When I mean, and if if you if your children have a spouse. Um, then the important thing is to keep your mouth shut and your purse open. So my successful uh, parenthood or in-lawhood or whatever you want to call it, I think is um, thanks to that. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of great. it is luck. A lot of it is luck. I've been really, really, really lucky. Yeah, someone someone liked mouth shut and purse open. Just so you know, in the chat that that was <laughs> that that's that's uh, so that was, a I lot see of that. those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, so you've talked about your physical health, mental health. Here's a question. What about folks? Um, I want to move to a topic that's maybe sensitive for some of our, our, our viewers today, kind of ageism in the workplace. And I know that's a little bit off topic, but honestly, a lot of people are going to retire and they're going to want to uh, or, or maybe they're feeling like they're being forced to retire because of ageism. What's been your observations and how do you advise people who are, you know, being pushed on about um, their age, I guess? And maybe the Kennedy School was different, but there may have been some moments you can share with us where you felt you were being pushed on because of your age. That's a, that's a really hard question because ageism exists on in a way on both ends of the spectrum. Sometimes young people are uh, discriminated mm -hmm. against. Um, I, 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 I'm somewhat involved in that, trying to make that better. There's a wonderful book um, called This Chair Rocks uh, written mm -hmm. by, uh, I forget her name, but I can look it up. And it's about how to you know navigate this time and deal with ageism. And there's a there's a bunch of stuff like that. But I think that as um, the population stays, it gets grows older because people are living longer. Um, I think that's an issue that has to be dealt with because I think that we we have a lot to offer us older folks. And but we also need to know when we're not being productive and when it's time for us to move on, that's a really hard decision to make. But if you work in in the right job and you're contributing, then ageism should not happen. And so mm -hmm. we need to work on that. That's an issue that I think is going to be more and more important as this population ages. I mean, people who are born now are very likely to live to be a hundred. Frightening thought that that is. But um, so yes, we have to worry about that. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. I just feel like everybody's out there doing well, and we're going to prove to the younger folks that we still can do that. Um, we still can make a contribution, uh, and maybe it's in a different way, but we still have plenty to give, and we should all just do it because it's so satisfying. Mm -hmm. I saw someone in the chat said that it took them a couple of years to kind of get comfortable with retiring. And I'll just, you know, maybe this is my little personal moment, but um, sometimes because we felt like we had to, we had to leave or that there was some, um, that we didn't get to leave on our own terms, there may be some um, healing that has to happen during those early retirement years to get ourselves back on track and comfortable with kind of what happened to us and at us. Um, I think it's important. I think it is something that, uh, to your point, Judy, I don't think we talk enough about kind of how ageism has hurt us and has hurt us personally and and um, leaves a scar. And it even can impact our efforts to re-engage with the community in a volunteer way or to try to do consulting. Sometimes we're not we're not welcomed because of that. That is such a pity, as you know, because we have so much to offer and and the wisdom of our years is is definitely worth tapping into. I, I really don't have the answer to that. I mean, I think that in the nonprofit world, which many of us are, that isn't as bad as it is in in in, you know, maybe 
public finance or something. Like that. I, I, I just don't know. But I think it's something we're going to have to face more and more and more. And the people coming along after us um, who are going to live even longer, hopefully, uh, are going to have to deal with it too. But this birth rate, I think, is going down and maybe we'll be more appreciated when there's not you know, when we're working longer and there aren't as many people who are waiting in line to take our place. I don't, I, I mean, that's, that one, you know, what there's, whoever said there's in and out, there's an inbox, an outbox and a too hard box. And that one goes in the too hard box. Hmm. Fair enough. Um, other questions. So uh, you, you've talked about community of friends and I keep going back to this. I know when I retired and I kind of, my work friends, um, you know, kind of moved on. I mean, some of them I stayed in touch with, but I wasn't seeing them every day. So my husband's Joseph Olszewski, who's a Kennedy School grad. He and I have been on a campaign this last year to try to meet new, new people, all different age groups. I saw someone in the chat put in, we joined the Harvard Club. And those of you who are not part of your local Harvard clubs, I'll just say that's a really nice way to meet people. There are active Kennedy School clubs all over the US. Um, Karen or Kristen can help you connect with those groups. There are special interest groups that the Kennedy School rubs, runs. There's one for state and local government that I'm active in. There's a state and look, uh, 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 I'm sorry, special interest group around women of the Kennedy School that's very active. So I'll just encourage groups are a way to join. Judy's mentioned that she's taken classes. Often your local higher ed institution does have my, I live near Georgetown University and anyone 65 and older who lives in the community can um, audit classes at Georgetown University as long as they're not lab classes. So do look at that. There's lots of programs like that. Other activities, Judy, that you have found, and then volunteering we talked about, where else can people look to for activities, for friendships? I mean, where else do you look? Well, the, the, I think that, um, for example, I'm really getting very involved with the, um, based on like the article that I had today in the paper mm -hmm. about being able to control your taking of your life. And so I've gotten very involved in the death with dignity movement. And I have met some fabulous people there and not everybody's old. And they are, they feel like I, I mean, this is my, this is my public policy thing. And I've met people through that and we'll meet more people through it because that's something that I really care about. So if you find a passion and you can get involved in it, you're not going to, it's not going to be all old people. It's just, you know, whatever, whatever you have to, you have to dip into a few things to find out what works for you. Like I said, I did several things, volunteer things before I found what worked for me. And um, it's, you know, maybe people can plan better than I did. Maybe you can try out, I know in your spare time, maybe you can get involved in something that you're thinking about spending more time in upon your retirement. Uh, planning is a good idea. And so, as someone who, worked in career planning forever it was pretty embarrassing for me not to plan better for my retirement I must say that. um we have some so uh judy's mentioning kind of passion projects i mean i think they can be intellectual passion projects we have some classmates and i'm looking at classmates on this call here but kathleen delasky we were just uh had dinner with her she's taken up painting um, there may be a passion. Uh, Naomi Goldstein, who's one of our classmates, is very creative and does knitting and baking. So maybe there's some passion projects that people have that are not in the work sphere or kind of the intellectual sphere, but that are um, kind of, you know, I'll call them side hustles, but passion projects or it's trying something. I have a, a neighbor who has taken classes at the Smithsonian and she's getting a certificate in art history of all things. That's great. And she's doing that as a side project, which I think is really interesting. Um, let me look at the chat and see what other questions we've got. Um, oh, Kay Kinney uh, put something in the chat, Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's, um, oh, joining choir, that's a great idea. 
I'm involved in my faith community. I got involved in my parish council, which is those of you, you have more time to do those things. Um, I see biking and joining a cycling group, people who like to do outdoor things. There's obviously hiking clubs, there's biking clubs, um, there's things like that. Um, sorry, I'm looking around. Uh, people who are writers. Um, Jody Litvak reports that she knows people who are writing their their the screenplay that's been in them for 40 years and they're writing it and pitching their screenplay. So that's a great idea. Um, any positive role models, Judy? Are there people that um, you know, either you know personally know or know them in the press that are role models for you on kind of retiring gracefully or aging gracefully? That's a really good question. Uh, nobody comes to mind. I mean, the people like this woman who wrote the book, Ash and Applewhite, I think is her name, about the one that I referred to about this chair of rocks. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, uh, there are several organizations that are online that are promoting, um, you know, promoting activities and, 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 and processing aging and, and they're all good, but I don't, I don't have, a role model. Let's put it this way. I'm trying to be one. <laughs> and uh, I don't have a specific role model. I just know that um, there is there is life after your after work. There is life and even in your 80s, which is where I am now, that there are ways to contribute. There are ways to be satisfied. And then, you know, sometimes we all have sometimes we have challenges and we do the best that we can and just move on. But what we have, to, what my thing is, here's a thing that I think is really important and that I try to focus on. And that is being grateful because I am mm. so lucky. And I think that being grateful is good for your health. And and I, I make a little fun of people who write down in their book on keeping, being grateful every night. I had a good day, the sun was out, blah, blah, blah. But it's really true. Being grateful is, I'll give you an example. I went to um, New York City a couple of weeks ago to celebrate this big birthday that I just had. And all I could think about was when I get on the train to go back to Boston all by myself, I hadn't, you know, I, my husband died a year and a half ago and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so sad when this is over. And I got on the train on Sunday afternoon in New York City and I sat down in my seat and I didn't feel sad. I just felt grateful. I And that was such a new thing for me to not, you know, to not get down about having something wonderful be over. So I really think it's important, terribly important to now when I go outside walking, I, I sometimes I stop and just look at a leaf or something like that. You just have to find joy wherever you can. And um, I think gratefulness is a huge, I'm, I'm, that's my next thing I'm going to think about is how to help people be more grateful and how to get, I mean, that's my next project, <laughs> I guess. Um, anyway, I can't, I think it really helps. And like I said, you don't have to get down every night and say, I'm great, write down three things that you're grateful for. But if you can think about it a little bit, it's very helpful. And I try to do that uh, when I get into bed at night. So that's- I see a, no, great, gratitude is a wonderful habit to get into and, and one that's, I think, overlooked. I see a funny post from Scott saying Mel Brooks has a new TV show on Hulu this week and he's at he's age 96. So right. that's a, maybe our role model is Mel Brooks of all places. Um, yeah, and then I don't, I'm not sure this is a question, but I'm gonna open it up for questions in just a moment. So please think of your questions. COVID, some of us are going to or have retired during COVID or right before COVID. And I think COVID put a strain on all of our social skills and kind of how we engage with each other. Judy, during COVID, um, what did you do to keep your spirits up? How did you handle kind of that, that, those difficult couple of years for all of us? And you had a husband who was very sick. So I, I don't mean to take you to a dark place, but um, no, talk about COVID and how you kept kept your spirits up because I, I think, think we all need some help. 
I think all of us were troubled by and, and still could be troubled by COVID. I think it's it had a terrible effect on so many of us and so many things and so many things that were important to us. I think, um, I really, I, I felt like this was, this was just a, a blow to everybody, not just to me, but to everybody. And I was, I was careful because, um, um, you know, I would mask sometimes in places where other people would not, because I definitely did not want to get sick. And I've had, um, and, and I've had, I, I went on a trip into way, way deep into the woods of Brazil. And I was worried that, you know, and I got my doctor to prescribe me some Paxlovid to take with me because there were no, nothing there. But I just, I do think that we have not yet processed all the changes that COVID has brought to us. And it, it's very, very sad. And people are, many people now are behaving as if nothing happened, but it's still happening. People are still dying. And uh, it's it's hard on everybody. And I think we all have to support one another in terms of understanding that this might be a bit, a bit of a difficult time for people. I mean, I'm fortunate in, in the sense that nobody close to me suffered badly, although one of my kids had it twice and my other kids and my grandchildren had it, but everybody's fine. And for that, I'm grateful <laughs> speaking and being grateful it's a it's mm -hmm. i don't know i mean it is changing the workforce and in, in terms of are people going back to work are people still working for home it's 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 a story of the ending of which has not been written and i i don't know what to predict well while i'm going to open up um the floor for questions for judy and while i do that let me just ask her one question and then then we'll open it up and please use the raise hand um, feature. Now we're not old enough that we don't know that we can't say we don't know how to do that. We should be able to do that, people. If you can't, just wave your hand and some, and hopefully I'll see you. Um, Judy, new. What is a new skill that you've learned in your retirement? You know, it can be something specific like baking or I tell me tell me something you've learned you've you've been taught or taught yourself. Well, um, one of my challenges is that I have uh, celiac disease, and that means that I can't eat anything that has gluten in it. And that's a whole lot of things if you don't know what has gluten in it, many things that you don't think do. So I have worked very hard on um, developing great meals that don't have gluten in them. So that's been one of one of my challenges. And I think I do a good job of that. Uh, other, I mean, Am I answering your question? I'm not really sure. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just kind of getting at what have you taught yourself or learned since you've retired? A new skill. For example, when I went to Joe Colt's uh, class on the Indian nation, I mean, boy, that raised my consciousness so much about Native Americans and some of their challenges. And so I really feel like if you keep yourself, try to learn like my, uh, if anybody, and this Zoom speaks Portuguese, maybe you'll understand how hard it is for an American to pronounce the words, but I'm I'm working on it. I'm trying to, but I can at least say bon dia and uh, obrigada and stuff like that. So uh, just keeping your mind active and whatever works for you is just so important and not allow yourself to get down because you're not contributing in the way that you used to, or because you're not that important and as you used to be when you know 50 people reported to you or whatever it's just you just have to find some other forms of satisfaction and you also need to be grateful for the amazing career and education and networks and everything that you've had and use them to the best you can right now great thank you so folks raise you use the um the raise hand button, you should be able to go down to see reactions down at the bottom of your screen. Hit that and you'll see something that says raise hand. And that lets me see, although Kristen, um, I don't think I see any questions. Let me ask, let me ask, let me ask questions to the group. How many of my alumni school friends out here in the audience have actually taken a class since they've retired or while they've or I guess while they're working. Put it in the chat. Tell me kind of a, a great class you took and where you took it. And let's see if we can um, 
call those up. So anybody that, um, and while you're putting that in there, I'm going to call on Roberta and ask Roberta to unmute yourself. <laughs> and I was, I was just responding to um, taking classes or what have you. So I'll put it in the chat. I raised my hand before you finished your question. <laughs> But it's watercolor. I took a watercolor class and I'm still taking it. It's a whole series and I keep taking it with the same instructor. So um, I have no aspirations to be a professional artist, but it's just very, very fun. And, um, and, and I usually have a great group of people in the classes. Fun. And yeah, I see just, someone. Let me just add that um, I don't know what it's like at other universities, but at Harvard, I take classes, I sit down on classes and my criteria is that the class has to be big enough so I don't get noticed. So <laughs> I have I have had some amazing experiences in, in some of the best classes at Harvard. And it's such such a pleasure because you go and you you drink the water and you don't have to do any work. It's, it's, it's really been a terrific uh, part of my life and I intend to continue doing that. I see in the chat, someone took tap dancing. That's impressive. Very impressive. I see a math class at Georgetown University um, and kind of, oh, interesting from David. You can look and see, but um, there wasn't any interpersonal connecting in his math class. So that's interesting. So put down any class you've taken. I took one on um, uh, James Baldwin at Georgetown University and African-American literature during the Harlem Renaissance, which was fascinating and really eye-opening to me. Jody, I see you have a hand up. Um, unmute and, and ask Jody, Judy a question. Hi, Judy. It's so good to see you. Um, <laughs> this is more of a statement than anything. Um, uh, a couple thoughts. Um, by the way, I have to say this. I don't know if Judy knows this, but those of us who were at the school at the time, some of us would call you Judy Noodle Pudding. And if you know, you <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know that. If you know, you know. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so I want to say, uh, two things. One, I know there have been questions about housing, and um, this is somewhat related to the work. I'm, I'm not retired, comma, yet, um, um, but I do think it's really important to think about your living situation and how you can be in a situation where you can live as independently as possible for as long as possible. I watched my parents wait too long until it became a crisis for them because they didn't want to move out of their house. Um, about seven plus years ago, the kids were gone and out of the house and we relocated um, to a place where, you know, great walkable community, single level, all of that stuff. So just really think about those things. I encourage that of everyone. The other thing I will say is um, those of you who know me know that I had a life change, unexpected life change about three years ago. Um, not retirement, but um, I think I've taken some things out of that um, that will be helpful. And again, it's sort of thinking things through. And one of the things that I've done in the last three years is just, I'm saying yes to a lot of things just to try them out, just to try them out. Um, and my comment about, you know, writing a screenplay, that's just because I live in Los Angeles. I don't have a screenplay I'm planning to write, just so you all know. But Judy, if you ever come out to the left, left coast, get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. That would be great. This is maybe um, a question for Karen or uh, Kristen. I, I'm seeing in the chat, people are interested about how to take classes at Harvard. I don't know that that's possible for HKS grads, but how do HKS grads, how should they find intellectual things at Harvard or at the Kennedy School? What's your, what's your advice on that? Because so many things come at us and it's sometimes hard to parse them, to be honest. We get so many invitations. I mean, there's a Harvard Extension School that I think you can take at any time. We also have um, at HKS the Executive Education. So those are courses that I think range from anywhere from one day to four days and can be virtual or in person. Um, I believe we've received questions before about auditing classes. And I think that you just have to go directly to the professor if they'll allow that. Um, but I also think too, well, when you're in close proximity to Cambridge, you know, we are, visitors are now allowed on campus as long as you walk through the Wexner security desk. So I think you can always like get the campus vibe if you're um, around, I don't know if that helps. 
any other questions for Judy? Otherwise, I've got a few more ones and then we'll wrap up and let everyone, my friends on the West Coast, go back to work. Or <laughs> or I see uh, I see Carol wrapped up in her quilt, so it must be very early for her. Um, any other questions? Um, I see Just Susan. Up, I see. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Mark, um, go ahead and unmute mute yourself and ask Ju Judy a question. Yeah, just just as we have that, you know, Kennedy School audience here. Uh, I know Judy's done some. Judy Bennell's done a lot of work trying to try to rope some of the alumni back in, but there does seem to be a big reservoir of people with, you know, kind of a lot of idealism and so forth, and now life experience who went through the Kennedy School and like to sort of use their retirement to to advance, you know, issues that are you know policy issues and so forth. Have you aware of, or, or do you know of ways in which, you know, alumni are being harnessed to? Sort of, I don't know, get involved in in the current discussions at the Kennedy School. I, I did did see, for example, there's a discussion of combining the MPA two, which I I went through, and the MPP programs. But sort of, you know, still kind of drawing on our life experience and 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 you know ties to the school in a ways that would be involving. Karen, I leave that to you. How do how do alums who now have time on their hand get involved with the Kennedy School? And that I'm giving you a softball, so. So make sure you you engage our wonderful community members. I, I mean, I think there's just such a number of ways to get involved with the Kennedy School. And as Judy mentioned, with the regional networks and shared interest groups, you know, that's a way to engage in conversations and create virtual programs for a larger alumni community. I think anything related to continuing education, that's the committee that Judy chairs on the alumni board. And I think if there's mm -hmm. other ideas for topics of interest, like that's something as well. And then as for the MPA MPP discussion, I was just speaking with Karina Santangelo this morning. I know we need to take it to the executive committee, um, but we are we are going to create a plan on how we can engage um, alumni that are interested in that discussion. And you're more than welcome to just send me an email or just send an email to any of the alumni board members, um, just so we can keep track of that. And I think when we're ready, to um, have that conversation, um, you know, then we'll circle back um, with with what that looks like or the input that we're looking for. Because I do agree, you all have life experiences. We also run like alumni talk policies, and we have reunion, and we're always looking. I also think to just keeping your information most up to date, whether it's on LinkedIn or the alumni directory, because that's really what we're looking or searching for when we're looking for speakers for um, the programs we're running internally. And there's we don't there's all so many interconnections. Um, we'll post the HKS alumni events page on there, but I also think um, you know, I'm also happy to have a conversation with you further. If you just send me an email, I'm always happy to connect with alumni and we can talk more about your involvement, um, whether it's with the alumni board or another way. That's great, Karen. Would yeah. you mind just posting your um your email into the chat? Oh, yes, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, and and Karen and Kristen and Hannah are great about responding. And we know, and I'll just I can say this because it's 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 we know that the classes from the early years, because there was no email when we graduated, because we've moved a lot because of things at the Kennedy School. No offense to anybody at the Kennedy School, we've kind of been lost. The classes of the seventies, eighties, nineties, and I'd say even the two thousands are not as active as we should be. I, I don't I don't want to point fingers, but do go on to the HKS website, go to alumni, make sure your um, directory information is up to date. That includes what you're doing, um, what your email address is, what your street address is, your phone number, because when Karen is looking at topic areas or when she's traveling to a different region, that's how she searches and finds out where you are and what you're doing. So please make sure it's up to date. Do reach out to Karen. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to put this on Karen, but she's delightful and she's wonderful about um, coming up with things to do. And if you have ideas for a panel that's alumni led and you can, you can do the heavy lifting, Karen's shop is very small. So she really can't, you can't come up with a good idea and expect her to do it. You have to do the idea but um, she will be very helpful, she and Kristen and Hannah. And I think as alums, we're looking to talk to each other, um, not necessarily just to hear from faculty or just to hear from students. And we can do that with Karen's help. So let me stop there. Wendy, I saw your, Wendy Feldman, I saw your hand up. Let me do Wendy and then Julie, I'll hit sure. you. And then we're probably gonna end up um, needing to stop this rich conversation. 
a great session, really uh, terrific and also fabulous to see some classmates. It's really lovely. Um, I just wanted to um, build on that comment um, uh, of yours, uh, Judy, uh, Judith, about um, engaging through the alumni directory. I mean, not that every event has to be a big event. We are also able to go into that directory and connect with our friends and colleagues or find someone who has a, a similar interest. And it's kind of up to us to be those uh, relentless self-starters, um, more so because we have less structure. Thank you, thank you, Wendy, and 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 do um, do keep yourself up to date, and do come up with good ideas. And then, Julie, last word from Julie. I just wanted to say hi because um, I did my work study in the career office with um, Judy in 1992 and 93. So it's been a long time. Hello. Hello. I was going to ask advice for people that aren't retiring yet, but want to make the most of their last 10, 15 years of work. But if we're out of time, um, I'll just be happy by getting to say hello. Uh, thank you, Julie. And thank you. Um for acknowledging the time constraint. I'm sorry we didn't get your question in. I will say we're working on a session on mid-career pivots, which some of us are a little bit late on that, but pivots are still possible at any age. And we wanna create a safe spot for people to talk about, you know, how do you pivot after you've been fired or laid off or wanna make a career change? So we're gonna to try to figure out how to do that alumni to alumni, so stay tuned. Um, and Anything just else, say, Judy? Parting words? No, I just want to say it has been such a pleasure to see you all, and I'm I will be close to the Kennedy School in my heart forever. <laughs> so thanks. And, and I'll put and I'll put in a plug. If you came in a little bit late, Judy has a fabulous article, very touching, in the Boston Globe today. It was in the chat. Please look at it. It's um, very meaningful. If you want to get a hold of Judy when you go to Cambridge and have a cup of coffee. Reach out to Karen. I'm sure Karen can connect you or Kristen can connect you or I can connect you. And you all just thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to my alumni community. You are the best. And I would say the best is yet to come for all of us. So I, I just thank I, you, Judy, for bringing me back to talk to all these great folks. It's been a pleasure. You are an inspiration. Thank you all. Have a great day, great afternoon. Um, Thank you all.